here we go. I'm going to read our text. And so out of respect for the word of God, even though you already have your computer on your lap, would you stand together with me? I'm going to read chapter 1, verse 1, and then invite the Lord to do something extraordinary here. Uh, this is my favorite book in the whole Bible, Revelation. And I could talk all day long and not stick with the slides. And so I'm praying that I share what the Lord wants me to share that will impact your lives as you serve the Lord. Oh, what a blessing. I'm going to read verse 1 and then pray. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and he signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Verse 3. Blessed is he who reads, that's me, and blessed are those who hear the words, that's you, of this prophecy, but here's the, the catch, and keep those things that are written in it, for the time is near. Let's pray. Father, I've read, and I pray these students have heard, and I pray that by the power of your spirit, by your grace that you offer to pour out on us, that we would keep, and as that Greek word means, we would treasure and guard those things that you teach us from your word, especially the next 20 hours that we share in this class. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, and here we go. God sent us hope in the book of Revelation, and boy, did those people need hope. I want you to think about uh, the theme of the book. Uh, the theme of the book is, the Re I just read it, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the only book of the Bible that actually gives the title and the first word in English. Uh, other Bible books do it in Greek and Hebrew, but this is the first one you see it in the, in the English, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. But the real theme of the book is Jesus is all I need. And I want you to think about how parallel your lives are to the lives of the people that got this book. Now remember, the primary interpretation, or as we say in seminary, the first canon of textual interpretation, that's what they call it, is that the, the interpretation of any scripture that you read, the primary, the first, the most important, what God meant was what he meant to the original recipients. Now see, we're not original. This wasn't written to me. Now every word in the book is written to me. I know we sing that. But it was actually written by Jesus Christ, look at this, to the second generation church over there in the red on that slide. They, none of them other than maybe the great great grandfathers in the churches, but but 99 point whatever percent had never met Jesus Christ in person. They had never met an apostle. They heard John was still alive, and by the way, he was the one writing it. But they were going through a hard time. Do you know why? God wasn't winning. Rome was winning. The world was getting darker. Have you ever thought about what it was like to live in the second generation church? Every apostle had been hunted down and executed by Rome, except one, the one that's writing this letter. He's the last one. God wasn't winning as far as they could see. Rome was winning. And Rome stood for everything opposite of the Bible, everything. It was pagan, witchcraft, immoral. The emperor sitting on the throne had a, the male emperor of Rome sitting on the throne had a male wife, okay? I mean, homosexuality wasn't tolerated, it was flaunted. It was the imperial way. And that was just a tiny sample of the world, of the Bible. The second generation church saw the world and it was very confusing. It appeared that God was not winning, Rome was winning, Rome was expanding, Rome was enslaving everyone in their path, and pride, cruelty, paganism, and witchcraft were all flourishing. 
Christians needed hope. Revelation is the most powerful dose of hope God could ever send. By the way, from church history, do you know what we know? There, and by the way, I'm, I'm gonna be referring to this the whole time. This is my journal because every time I teach a course, I do whatever the students are doing. And so I have my little tabs here and I've, I've read every chapter and I've done a devotional study on it and I've written a title like all of you have to do, you know, title for every chapter of the Bible, one of your assignments. And then I've written an application prayer. And I'm gonna to refer to this the whole time uh, as I teach because I'm hoping to infect all of you with something that has become a lifelong habit for me. And that is, I want to understand every chapter and every verse of the Bible. And not just understand it so I can talk about it, but understand it so I can know God better and experience everything he has for me and share that hope with the world. And that's why I'm here. So Jesus is all we need. And the second generation church saw the world and it was very confusing, I told you that. It appeared God wasn't winning, Rome was winning, and Christians needed hope. So what does God do? Revelation is the most powerful dose of hope. And as I was just saying, church history shows us that. Did you know they have, there are philologists, people who study the text, the words of the text of the Bible. And especially in the 19th century, as they were excavating and finding all the manuscripts all over the place and re-looking uh, at all the manuscripts that, that had been found during the Renaissance and the Reformation and since, they scientifically began to tabulate all the extant, that means continuing to exist, sermons of the first and second century church, this, this time period. And other than the biblical documents and a couple letters, there weren't any, but right after John on Patmos, in the second century, that's the 100s on, they started finding sermons. And so they started taking these sermons, some of them were in Latin, some of them were in Greek, and they started tabulating the actual words that were in the sermon, and they found that they could find passages from Genesis and Exodus and the Gospel by Mark and the, the Book of Romans and etc., where the, the pastors taught the Bible. And they would quote a verse as they were teaching. So they started tabulating all the verses found in the ancient sermons. And they started counting how many were in Genesis, how many were in Exodus, because they wanted to see what was the most popular book that was taught to the early church. The bottom line is this, there's only one book of the Bible in the early church sermons, you can find every word talked about and read before the congregation by the preacher. Only one book, and it's not Genesis, it's not the Psalms, it's not Philippians and all the hope and joy, and it's not Romans and all that doctrine. The only book that we know was taught every single word, most popular book of the ancient church, is the one we're gonna spend 20 hours in. Revelation was so popular because it was the most powerful dose of hope that God could send. He shares the history of the future. Did you catch that? Do you know what Revelation is? Revelation is not a prediction. It's the actual history written by God of what's gonna happen. Because from God's perspective, and I want you to think, God is seated on his throne, and the book of Isaiah says, interestingly enough, that God sees the end from the beginning continuously at the same time. Now that sounds, you know, like Doctor Strange or whatever from the Avengers, you know, that he can, you know, go, or I don't know how he does it, but he goes forward and backward with time with his witchcraft. By the way, that's witchcraft, you know and it's offensive to God for us to be entertained by witchcraft. And so it's not something that's, that's a good thing to be a master of, understanding all that. But God sees the ending from the beginning continuously. So when John is transported in Revelation to heaven, John stands there and he looks down and he's seeing, <gasps> and he's trying to write down what he's seeing. He's not seeing what will happen. He was actually seeing it 
happen. And you go, wait a minute, if it hasn't happened yet, how could he see it happening? Because God is above time. Time is only one of many dimensions. We don't know how many dimensions, and don't let your science fiction stuff you know, blur it. God sits above time because he created it and everything else. And what he's told us, and we don't need to speculate about anything else, God sees everything happening at once. And God knows what's going to happen. And he wrote down, look at this, a history of the future. That's what you have here. I mean, this is priceless. And it's very encouraging. And the ending is God wins. I mean, isn't it good to know? The church needed to know that because it didn't look like it to them in the second century. It didn't look like God was going to win. I mean, Rome was building aqueducts that were 100 miles long. They were building massive, you know, amphitheaters and killing Christians in them. Rome was hunting down Christians. And they heard the good news. God wins. Christ is going to return. And it all ends with us with him. You remember what it says about Jesus coming and at Christmas time? His name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is what? God with us. And if God is with us, the good news is <laughs> we're with God. And so that's the good news of the ending. God knows the future. Okay, let's go through what it says. Now look back at verse 1, and we're going to be... We're going to be looking either deeply or a little bit at all 404 verses. There are 404 verses in Revelation. There are 303 in Hebrews. And when I teach that, it's much easier because it's shorter. But there are 404. So I'm going to be talking very fast. And you can listen fast, and, and uh, together we're going to learn. But it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. God reveals himself in Christ. What do I mean by that? What does it say in Hebrews 1? It says Jesus is the exact representation of God. What did Jesus tell doubting Thomas in chapter 14 of the Gospel by John? He looked to him and he said, Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember, doubting Thomas, was, boy, I'm so glad for doubting Thomas. Because he asked the questions all of us ask, and the other disciples were too embarrassed to ask it. He said, how are we going to get there, and how do we know, and... He just was so troubled, which is true about most Christians. I've been a pastor for a lot of years. A lot of Christians don't feel saved, don't have assurance of salvation, certainly aren't bold, and hardly have hunger for the Bible. That's what most Christians are like, a lot like Thomas. So Jesus understands struggles and confusion and fears and doubts. And he looked at Thomas and he said, Thomas, look at me. When you see me, Jesus said, you're looking at the Father. I am the exact representation of God. Wow. So God reveals himself in Christ. That's why he gave this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is a gift from God, the Father, to Jesus Christ to give to us. Because look what it says which God, the Father, gave him, God the Son, to show his servants. That's us. To show us what? Number one, the revelation of Christ. Number two, the map of the future. What, what is that? Keep reading the verse. The things which must shortly, boy, that's an interesting word, shortly. It isn't soonly, it's shortly. Now, all the boys here, uh, you know, I teach here every year, and there was one year, I don't remember which year it was, but there was a guy that had the, he had a car or a truck so high you had to have a little ladder to get up into it. Its tires must have been this big. I don't know how much those tires cost. It was always parked out there, this monster truck, you know? So when I said tachometer, I mean, he sat right up in class. I could see him. It was a car thing, and he was a car guy. And so a tachometer, you know, that's the Greek word right here, tachos. You know, a tachometer shows how fast your, your motor is spinning. It means fast or rapid. Not, it doesn't mean soon. It means 
quickly, fast. And so what he's saying is, the things which must very rapidly take place, when these things take place, it's just going to be unstoppably, everyone's going to be watching it, and no one's going to miss it. It's just going to be a tidal wave. It's kind of like all the pictures you've seen in the movies of, you know, the day after tomorrow or whatever they're called, where a disaster and they're all standing frozen as a wave comes and knocks over the Statue of Liberty and drowns them all, you know. They're just paralyzed. That's what the tribulation picture is. It's a tidal wave coming, everyone sees it, and it goes. Okay, to show his servants, that's us, the things which are gonna tacos, take place shortly, and he sent and signified him by his angel to his servant John, and John bore witness, and he, on the island of Patmos, and by the way, if technology works, Bonnie and I just, my wonderful wife Bonnie, who distracts me, even saying her name distracts me, uh, but we were invited to teach the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos, <laughs> the whole book. And so when I got done, I stood, I put my Bible on a rock, and I, I taped a message to you guys. And I hope it works. It's second hour and I'm gonna play it. And uh, the audio's not very good. So God gave the only map of the future. By the way, that map of the future totally parallels another map of the future that Paul gives. Do you remember Paul? I'm not teaching Acts, but do you remember Paul? Have you already had Acts? Okay. Do you remember Mars Hill? And he's talking to all those people, those philosophers and everyone, and he gives the gospel starting in verse 24 through verse 31, and he actually outlines the Bible in three parts. It was a good three-point sermon. You know, in homiletics, they teach good sermons have three points, and long sermons have more, you know. Um, but the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, is about the creator, and we find him ignored. Starting in Genesis chapter 3, there's a promise of the redeemer, but he ends up being rejected and crucified. This is what Paul's telling all these brilliant Athenians. But the interesting thing about Paul is, when he shared the gospel, he always tacks on this, this impending doom stuff. And what he said is, there's a judge coming. That, that's how he ends his gospel presentation. He said, that creator that you've ignored, that redeemer that came and died for your sins that you're rejecting, he's coming back. You know what it says in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7? He's coming in flaming fire, bringing vengeance on those who have ignored him and rejected him. He's coming. So that's kind of an outline of the whole Bible. Uh, Genesis 1 and 2 is the creator. Sin comes, so we need a redeemer. He's rejected until God gets uh, his saints around the throne in Revelation 5, and then it's the unfolding of the judge coming and cleaning up and winning and conquering the world. So if we were to, real quickly, overview how the early church, why were they so excited about Revelation? Well, in chapter one they found out we can have hope because while we're here in all of our troubles, we can love and serve God as we struggle through life. How did Paul describe Christians when you read his epistles? Paul calls us, now I'm gonna speak in Greek. See if you can understand it. I'm going to speak in Greek and see if it sounds like anything you've ever heard of. The description Paul gave of Christians when he wrote to the Philippians, he called us soon agonizomai. Does that agonizomai sound like an English word? What does it sound like? Agonize. You ever agonized? Agonized over a test or studying or a loved one sick or parent, you know, or grandparent dying? Agonize. You know what Paul called Christians? Soon, that's the Greek preposition with. S-U-N in Greek means with in English. Agonizomai means struggling, agonizing. Paul said Christians are fellow strugglers. That's why we're supposed to be close to each other. We're all struggling. We're all struggling with the same things. God says there's no temptation that's ever taken you that's not common to man. But God is faithful. He'll always make a, an exit door. Like I love how they illustrate my sermons with 
See that word exit? Every time we're tempted, there's an exit door just like that one there. And guess who's standing with both doors open with their arms out? Jesus. He's saying, you don't have to give in to that. You don't have to, to disobey me. Come on, come to me. God is faithful because he knows we're struggling. So as they read Revelation 1, they, they saw John was struggling. And so God shows Jesus, the risen God the Son in his power and glory, coming to help us and stand with us anywhere we are. Where was John? He was on Patmos. Patmos was miles from anywhere. It was a Roman prison colony, kind of like Siberia or a gulag, if you ever heard of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you know, the gulags uh, uh, out there in Siberia. We have hope because we're part of God's saints. We're fellow strugglers, and Jesus knows our address. He knows right where we are. And then we get to chapter 2 and 3. Jesus walks among us. I mean, he's not just visiting Patmos. In chapter 2 and 3, we find out Jesus is actually walking among believers as they gather in fellowship at the church. Jesus walks among us in his church. By the way, Jesus comes to church whenever it gathers. Whenever a body of true believers gathers, Jesus said, I'm there too. That's why I, I was brought up that whenever the church met, my parents took us, whether we wanted to go or not. Why? They said, you don't want to miss Jesus being there. You know, I don't think a lot of people go to church because Jesus is there. They go there because of the music, or they go there because their friends are there, or they go there because they have to. But the reason we're supposed to go there is Jesus walks among us, his church, pointing out to each of his children what we're doing, both right and wrong. See, when Jesus goes in chapters 2 and 3 in Revelation, he's pointing out, oh, that was really good. That's the church in Philadelphia. No, they weren't doing anything wrong that he listed. Were they sinning? Yes. Did he talk about it? No. Why? Because it is possible to have a life as a believer that absolutely pleases God, and he doesn't have to criticize anything because we are convicted when we sin, and we immediately confess and forsake and ask for his cleansing, and we go on, and he goes, that's the way. And they were the only church like that. And so that's why people love Revelation. They saw themselves in there. They saw you could live a life struggling and please the Lord. They saw that you could live stumbling and falling into sin, and yet confessing and repenting and forsaking and finding his cleansing. And so each of us, if we listen for him pointing out what we're doing that pleases him and what we're doing that doesn't, we can be more useful. You know what the greatest thing in all of life is? To be useful to God. That's what being holy is. It's being useful, set apart. So in our little illustration, Revelation has seven parts. Part one, part two, part three, four, five, six, seven. The first, it starts with the first three chapters, the church on earth. That's where we are. And the church on earth is promised to be taken. Uh, Jesus told Doubting Thomas and the rest, I go and prepare a place for you. Jesus said, in the same way you see me going, I'm coming back. Jesus said in 1 Corinthians 15 that at the last trump, the dead in Christ will rise first and we're all going. He said in 1 Thessalonians 4 that, that the, the dead will not be left behind, that the living will not precede those that are raised from the dead. And finally, in Revelation 3, he explains that we will be kept from the hour of his wrath. And where are we headed? We're headed, and this is what really brought him hope. Jesus brings each of us safely to heaven, just like he promised to do. We see ourselves there in chapters four and five, standing around his throne after we've finished the plan. Remember, God's watching everything from the beginning to the end. And right there is our life. And he says, I have a plan how did Jack Wurtson put it? It's the duty of every believer to reach their generation for Christ or something very similar to that. Boom. It's, God says, I have a plan for you. It's your duty to please me, to do what I've planned for you to do. How do we do that? 
we start every day, checking in. Kind of like being a good employee. All the jobs I've had that I wasn't the manager, I had a manager and I would check with the manager what exactly they wanted me to do that day because my time belonged to them and they were paying me and they were in charge. That's all the Lord wants. And so we check in with him every day till he's finished with us doing his plan and then he takes us to be with him. And so the church saw that and they saw themselves as they were the church in heaven and they saw that they were going to get the reward, that's what 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 5 talk about, that we're actually going to get a reward for how we live for the Lord. But the church also had hope because as soon as we get to chapter 6, finally they're wondering, what about the bad guys that, that did all this evil, that dragged off and murdered and did everything we're seeing today, all the murder and and evil that's unabated. I mean, it's just going. Well, lost humanity, and I love how God does this, believes in evolution and denies biblical creationism, so the creator himself shows them his power. Finally, it isn't just old answers in Genesis harping on the fact that there's a real creator God and, and every evangelical witnessing servant of the Lord and pastor and ministry saying it. Finally, God gets everyone's attention. The creator shows him his power and earth dwellers who worship Mother Earth. By the way, in the book of Daniel, have you guys had Daniel yet? It's coming. In the book of Daniel, do you know how it describes the Antichrist? He worships the God of forces. Uh, it, there's, and by the time we get to Revelation, it's expanded and everybody, everybody that's unsaved is called an earth dweller. What that means is, this is all they care about. This planet, this place. We're going to do anything to save this place. We need this earth. As opposed to how Hebrews describes us. Hebrews says, we look for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Paul put it this way, our citizenship is not here. It's in heaven. And we're expectantly awaiting being taken to the place he's prepared for us. So there's a real contrast between the orientation of lost people. Their orientation is, whoop, here. Save the earth. Protect the earth. Uh, animals and plants and now fungi are equally as valuable as humans. And we'll protect any species while we don't protect human species not yet born. Do you understand what I mean? The, it's, it's so blatant in our generation. So earth dwellers who worship Mother Earth, God first allows natural disasters to amplify at every level. You're starting to see that, aren't you? Aren't you seeing it? We're, we had the hottest year on record last year. And boy, they already found out the forest fires in Canada didn't go out with the snow. They're still burning under the snow. And they said, Wow, 2024 is going to be one of the greatest forest fire years. I mean, today, I mean, Rome, did you see any pictures of what it looks like in Rome today? Total smoke, you know, and dust in Rome. Why? It's just because we have natural disasters amplifying at every level. Continuing, lost humanity is fascinated with demons. That's what it says in chapter 9. To the end, they won't stop worshiping their demons. You go, demons? Yeah, look at, look at what most movies are about nowadays. About half of all movies, at least half, have demonic, huge powers in them. Uh, lost humanity is fascinated with demons. So God opens a pit and lets humanity taste the searing torment. That's what chapter nine is about. Wait till we get there. God says, you like demons so much? How about meeting some? Whoop, he opens the, the pit and these demons come out and it says they hunt people. You know, demons aren't stopped by doors or walls or cement or steel because a demon is an immaterial spirit. They are a fallen angel. Uh, actually, the word daimon, demon right here, the Greek word daimon means intelligence. It's an intelligent spirit that knows every language in the world, is not stopped by any physical object, can listen to you, can, 
They know where every treasure is hidden. They know where every person is. And they can guide people that surrender to them to do fantastic things. See, that's the lure of the occult. There's real power there. It's not from God. See, there's only two sources of power in the universe. Actually, one source, and God has allowed Satan at this current time to be the God of this world. And he's over the demons, and Satan also is the prince of the power of the air. He's over the weather, and he's over the paranormal and can do all kinds of stuff. So God shows them all that. And lost humanity seeks to rule themselves and reject God's Messiah, so God sends them a fake Jesus. He's called the beast. He's the worst human that ever lives. And he's indwelt by Satan, and he leads humanity to destruction by becoming their God. That's Revelation 10 to 13. And from 14 to 16, lost humanity believes in evolution and reveres the earth and denies biblical creationism. So God, the Son, the Creator, systematically destroys the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land. He sends earthquakes, smoke, fires, red tides, global warming, volcanoes, tsunamis, asteroids, comets, and meteors. Those are the final divine environmental destructions. That's ch chapter 14, 15, and 16 of Revelation. And then comes, do you know what the crescendo is? Armageddon. That's, that's the ultimate boom. An earthquake hits, and then all of a sudden, they see the skies open, and they just see this white thing, and fanning out behind this white horse that comes into view is Jesus Christ. And all the angels, actually says that in chapter 25 and 26 of Matthew, that he's going to bring all the angels, first time all of them have left heaven, and then all the saints. Wow, that's us. We'll be with them at the second coming. And the next chapter... Chapter 17, lost humanity wants false religion and human achievements, so God destroys all religions. That's chapter 17. Lost humanity wants comfort and entertainment and possessions more than God, so the idolatry of covetousness, so God destroys all their possessions. That's chapter 18. So basically, all of that is right there. Boom. The tribulation. What I just read for the last five minutes is the tribulation, but it doesn't end there. Lost humanity rejected their creator and redeemer, so Christ the king that on that white horse I just described, returns as judge, and for a thousand years he keeps his promises. He shows he can renew the earth. But nearly all of humanity rebels. Wait till we get to that chapter, it's so sad. So the final judgment comes, and he casts all the rebels into the lake of fire. So basically what we have is the second coming of Christ, in flaming fire taking vengeance. He sets up his kingdom, and we have the first time there's paradise on earth since the Garden of Eden, and Jesus is literally ruling. That's called the millennium. Well, most people reject him, and so we have the rebellion in chapter 20, verses seven to 15, and the great GWT means great white throne. So that's number six, and here's the final point of Revelation. As saints, we see ourselves enjoying God's invitation to dwell in his captivating, satisfying, sustaining presence. God is with us, and we're at home in heaven forever. And that is the last part of the plan. And I guess that's why the early church got so excited. They're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Most of the saints, the early saints, were poor and slaves. Great, great, vast majority of them were very poor, and many of them were slaves. That's why they had church at night, because the slaves worked all day. That's why people were falling out of the windows when Paul was preaching, because they had worked all day, and now they came to this evening service, and, and they fall asleep and fall out the window. So basically, and this is very important, if some of you have kind of lapsed into somnambulism, you know, you're half asleep or whatever, this is what the final exam is all about, you being able to match these seven events. Now, this is in your notes, but just start thinking about this you should start thinking about Revelation has seven clear events. The first three chapters are Christ's church on earth. Then chapter four and five, and again in the first half of chapter 19, we see his church and the saints in heaven. And then the tribulation unfolds from six to 18. Jesus returns at the second half of chapter 19. He reigns over the earth for six verses in chapter 20. And then there's a rebellion and the 
the whole horror of the great white throne and being cast in the lake of fire. And the last two chapters are describing heaven. And why do we have that? Because God says, you need to know my plan. And so that's why he sent us that. Well, the next verse, or the next part of verse one, look what it says. He sent and signified by his angel to his servant, John. Look up, he gave this to show his servants. So twice in verse one, it, it's this servant thing. So that, by the way, these lessons, these are actually what, this is actually what's written down. I'm just telling you what you can see as you go through this book. And this is how I think. I wrote, we're to be God's servants. And then I wrote, what does it mean to be a servant of God? And isn't that thrown around a lot? Oh, we serve the Lord. What, what on earth does that mean? Well, God always, anything we need to know, defines it. In two verses, Acts 13, 36 and 1 Corinthians 4, 1, we find the same word used by the Holy Spirit to describe David in the Old Testament. By the way, who's David in the Old Testament? He's the man after God's own what? Yeah. Even though he broke all 10 of the commandments, Jesus is called the son of whom? David. That wicked, adulterous David? Jesus says, I'm the son of David. Wow. David calls himself a servant of God in Acts 13, 30. Actually, God, through his servant Paul, calls David a servant of God. And Paul, the most important New Testament saint, the one that wrote half the New Testament we read, the one through whose gospel most of us have come to salvation, I mean, who planted so many churches that, that crisscrossed the ancient world and went on all the trade routes, Paul and David, are both called the same word. And it's the word for a Roman galley slave. You go, what? The word is, here's the Greek word, huper retes. It's one word, huper retes. Huper means below or underneath. Retes means rower. Look at this. This is Ben-Hur. This is, see, this is a trireme. This is a rowing boat with Roman soldiers with all these paddles, these oars that are as long as telephone poles. And to be a galley slave, all you had to do is row to the captain's feet. The captain would go with a hammer up there. And he was hitting a hammer and boom, boom, you pulled your paddle. You had to row together. There were, look how many men are on these, there was multiple people on the paddles. You had to trust the captain. By the way, you can't see it because it's so little, but they were chained to the boat. The galley slaves were chained to the boat. That means you had no access to water or food and you were going nowhere except what the captain wanted for you. Fourthly, you were in it for life. Uh, Galley slaves were kind of like AA batteries. What do you do with your AA battery when it doesn't work anymore? You should have a rechargeable, but most people don't. What do you do with them? Oh, you put them on your shelf and you remember them over the years. That one served me last year. No, you, most people throw them away. That's what galley slaves were. They were disposable. They actually, when they couldn't paddle anymore, they threw them in the ocean. Shark food. So they were chained for life and by the way, when they were doing their job, no one saw them because they were below deck. Now that's a word study of hupe retes, that David is called one of those, Paul is called one of those. That's a description of a servant. So what does it mean to us? We're supposed to be submissive. That means we surrender and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? We're supposed to be sensitive. We realize we're part of a body of Christ with other Christians around us. We're supposed to be trusting. God knows what he's planned for us. He knows, bef he put us in that family. He made us like we are. He gave us all those opportunities. We're supposed to submit to that and trust him. We're supposed to be chained to him for life. That's called dedication. That's the campfire and just saying, all I am, all I have, all I ever will be. We used to stick that in the back of our Bible. They gave us a sticker at Word of Life, dedication, campfire services, and I have one and Bonnie has one in our Bible. You know what that is? Dedication. Saying, 
I'm chained by love to you for life, O Christ. And by the way, we're supposed to be humble. A galley slave doing his job was never seen. And so that's what God wants. Well, let's go to the next verse. We only have six minutes. Uh, let's go to verse three. Blessed is he who reads, those who hear, and keep. This is the only, only place that God promises a blessing just for hearing Revelation read because in the ancient world they had one manuscript and a whole church and they read it out loud for everybody to hear because no one could afford a copy. And so if you listen to the word of God, you got blessed. If you were the one that would stand in front and read it, you got blessed. But it was tied to this, look at this. We're supposed to be exposed to the word of God, so come to where it's read or get your own copy and expose yourself to word of God. Hearing actually means you focus in and listen. You actually don't just hear with your ears, you hear with your heart. And so you, you're focusing and saying, God, you're saying something, I wanna know what it is, but then you say, I don't wanna just be a hearer of the word like James said, I wanna be a what? A doer. And so God said that gives a great blessing. Okay, five minutes. Following Jesus was for all believers then and now. Look what it says in verse four. John to the seven churches, plural. Why seven? Seven, we'll see, we're gonna talk about this so many times. There were a lot more than seven churches. But seven in the Bible is a set, a complete set. If you can find a seven, you found a set. Kind of like seven days in the week, you know. And so there, there is, there's something about this that Jesus was for all believers then, the second generation, and now. Look at verse five. I, I love verse five. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, we're gonna look at all these names, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Look at this. To him who loved us and washed or loosed us from our sins with his blood. Jesus loves us. Jesus liberates us, and Jesus washes us. Um, Revelation explains, look at verse seven. Uh, he's coming in the clouds. All the Old Testament promises about the return of Christ, it distills them down and tells us about them, his second coming. And then verse eight, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and was, and the Almighty. God offers complete security. Now look at this. This is Russia's number one missile. It's called the RS-28, the Sarmat. It has 16 warheads. It can completely obliterate, incinerate, and melt 250,000 square miles. And Russia doesn't just have one of these. They're scattered all throughout the mountains of Siberia in these hardened tunnels, and they pull them around on, on trucks and trains so that no one ever knows where they all are. Each of those 16 warheads travels at seven times the speed of a sniper bullet. So I mean, we're talking about, these things travel 20,000 miles, 24,000 miles an hour when they're going to their target. One missile, one missile fired from either a submarine or one of these trucks, one missile would kill every living thing in France. I mean, the whole country. So just think what it'd do to us. Well, you know, that scares people. And so there's supposed to be something about us knowing who we are, where we're headed, what's coming, who we belong to, what he can do, what's the end result of those that don't know him and where we're going that affects us. So before we go, we have two minutes. This is a great time to evangelize. Um, People around us are a little scared. What happened, uh, Bonnie and I, this is all, what I'm doing right now is all we do. We just travel, uh, I mean, I, I teach in Word of Life Chile and Word of Life Ecuador and Argentina and uh, all over in the US and Hungary and Korea and Japan and wherever we are, we teach. But what's amazing is that's what the QR code is. Uh, a lot of times wherever we go, people capture it and they put it online and YouTube actually hosts us for free, they don't even charge us. 
They have every class I've ever taught for 30 years. Isn't that nice of them? And so Bonnie and I landed at the airport in Tampa, and we were speaking during COVID, and, and I was at the 7-Eleven, and at the 7-Eleven, they had all the glass up, remember during COVID, so there was only a little hole. So I was leaning over saying to the lady, you have three credit card machines. Which one do you want me to put my credit card in? I was trying to figure out how to pay for my milk that I bought at midnight at the 7-Eleven. As I said that, a voice behind me said, Dr. Barnett, I'd recognize that voice anywhere. And I turned around, and the most gnarly, burly truck driver you've ever seen was standing there behind me with the biggest smile, and he said, I was scared to death. I'm a truck driver. I typed knowing God in my computer. Google put a link to one of your videos. I started watching your classes. He said, I've never seen you because I listen in my truck. I, I listen to the videos. But he said, I, I got saved in my truck. And he said, thank you for pointing me to the Lord. What a time to evangelize.